Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Welcome to this special breaking news edition of the Voices for Nature and Peace podcast, May 30th, 2020. In the background of this introduction are the sounds of a protest in Washington, D.C. this evening, as streamed on twitch.tv slash woke. been out here for all three days of the D.C. protest. That was definitely the most intense moment. They're still firing into the crowd. In this episode, I talk with Blank, an old indie media comrade of mine from Portland, Oregon. Blank attended the George Floyd protests in Portland last night and the night before. On the second evening, he was tear gassed. In our conversation, he gives a blow by blow report of both evenings, and in the last third of the broadcast, we talk about some of the larger issues behind these protests. Without further ado, here is Blank. Yeah, I just want to give you a heads up. I'm just watching a live uh, video from Portland, and uh, the whole Burnside Bridge right now is uh, completely packed full of people heading into downtown. It's past curfew here, too. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. right. Okay. So, so yeah, so we're rolling at this point, and yeah. you're in Portland, Oregon. Yes. Okay. And how many years have you lived in Portland, Oregon? Uh, I was born here, so since 1983. Okay. That's a good number of years, like uh, almost 40, 30 some years. Yeah. Okay. 37. So, right. So, so anything that you're seeing or whatever, you're able to compare to things, other things you've seen in that same place. Yes. Over a number of years. So that helps. That helps to give us some context on it. So um, you said that there's uh, right now you're seeing a situation on the Burnside Bridge. Yeah, it looks like it keeps growing from the camera angle I have. It appears that there, there is possibly police on the bridge on one end. But it looks like there's at least two 2,000 people there. So... Oh wow! Okay, so you were downtown, uh, like the last night or the night before? I was uh, last night and the night before uh, last. So I I was down there when there was the first day and then the second day okay. of protest. So yeah, the, the first day was pretty crazy and got really hectic. Uh, there was a lot of windows got smashed, um, a lot of stores got uh, ransacked, and uh, police were having a really hard time keeping up that night. Um, that was the first night that, um, that's, that was, that was when the, the justice center, otherwise known as the injustice center to a lot of us here in Portland, um, was, uh, had its windows smashed and there was fires set on the first level and the sprinkler system went off and, uh, totally destroyed all the offices on the first level down there. And, wow. uh, that's, uh, that's impressive. Yeah, I, I've never seen anything like that. I think that building is like 25 years old, um, 30 years old maybe, and there's there's nothing in its history or anything like that has ever happened to it. And uh, like that. And there's tons of tagging that's still there on the outside of the building. Yesterday when I was down there, they were taking out all the cubicles and all the desks and everything like that, and they were loading them up into uh, big uh, moving trucks, and uh, they were just getting everything out of there while there was a police presence, and they had it fenced off. Uh, kind of guarding it so nobody could enter it. And uh, there was a bunch of protesters across the street at the uh, the Mark Hatfield Federal Building across the street, which is just uh, on, just right across the street on the north side. So everybody was kind of over there, and there was a scaffolding, and they're up on people were up on top of the scaffolding, and it was kind of like um, uh, about a floor above the sidewalk elevated, and you had just people up there um, just chanting, uh, you know, um, 
George Floyd's name and, um, you know, hands up, don't shoot other things like that. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty interesting. It's been, it's been an interesting past, uh, three days. So for sure down there today, um, I don't know. They, they, uh, today we had, uh, like a lot of people that were going down there. I didn't go down there personally, but it looks like they did the same thing. Um, so like on the second day I went, I went down there and, um, people were kind of expecting more protests to happen. Th- there wasn't any um, smashing or anything like that on the second day, but um, there, there was a curfew that was instituted by the mayor. Right. Um, so, so, so hold on one second. Where were uh, where were people gathering downtown? Uh, which day? On the uh, second day. On the second day, people were uh, gathering in the same place, uh, right across the street. From the the Justice Center. Okay, um, right. So that's that square where all the government buildings are. Like that's where City Hall is too. Yeah, it's the same general area. It's like the government area of Portland, right there. Right, um, and uh, the elk statue in the middle of the street. Yeah, that's on Main Street. Yeah. Right, that's the one you get to see in uh, my own private Idaho. Yeah, yeah. Just, that's, it, yeah. it was like it, it was like Third and Main, and yeah, between Third and Main and Third and Southwest Salmon Street. Right. right. There. Okay. Cool. So that that's a place that is uh, typically a meetup place for um, for protests. That and uh, Pioneer Square, maybe. Yeah, I believe it's uh, called Chapman Square. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the that's the park block area that it's in, um, and then it's right across from uh, Terry Shrunk Plaza. Right. Right. And so the mayor Ted Wheeler, who was recently reelected, I believe, he. No. He no. hasn't been reelected. No, no, no. He 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 uh he didn't win his um his uh runoff. Uh he has to get fifty percent plus one to uh win hands down. And because he only got like forty nine point three six percent, he's now in a runoff with oh, another candidate. Nice. Okay. I was under the impression he'd gotten over fifty and he was in. I'm glad to hear that somebody's running against him. Yeah, I forget her name, but uh she seems like she's pretty good. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So then he, um, Wheeler, he announced a curfew for the second night, which was last night for 8 p.m. So no one was supposed to be out after 8. That's right. Um, Wheeler, uh, his mother is, um, she's like nearing the end of her life. And apparently he was out of town. Um, and uh, he gets a call from whoever he gets a call from because the mayor in Portland is also the police chief, I mean, police commissioner. Um, and um, the, the police chief, who's been uh, newly appointed, she's furloughed, so she wasn't even there. Um, so he gets a call <laughs> saying that uh, he needs to show up. There's a situation. And so he flies back, and he arrives back in Portland from wherever he was at like 3 a.m. in the morning. He has a press conference at 5 a.m. or something in the morning. It was very early. And he announces that he's going to have a curfew from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. And um, this is on Saturday. And what happens is uh, people are out and they're gathering, especially after seeing everything that happened the night before. And uh, it's pretty peaceful. People are just out there hanging out, meeting up with each other, talking. Um, Police... um, out there you could tell you could feel that police were uh pissed off and uh they were not happy and um what ends up happening is um it gets close it gets it's seven o'clock almost seven o'clock or so and um there's people that are laying in the middle of uh third and um i forget the, i think it's third and taylor it's it's the next street down from maine right uh, just south of it a block down mm-hmm. and um People are laying in the street, and um, all of a sudden, um, like they're they're laying down there with on their stomachs with uh, their hands behind their back in the same uh, prone position that they had um, George Floyd in. And there's probably right. about a hundred people doing it. And the police uh, got really upset that people were blocking traffic. Everybody had been blocking traffic for uh, quite a while now, uh, at least a couple hours, and and. Um, yeah, they uh, they decided that at some point they're going to pepper spray somebody, and uh, somebody uh, threw some empty water bottles at them, and then the police started shooting rubber bullets into the crowd, and they started deploying flashbangs into the crowd, 
and uh, people started running, and then uh, they started shooting tear gas into the park. And I'm talking like it, it was like seeing like Seattle, like WTO 1999 levels of tear gas. It was pretty intense. And um, I'm out there, and I'm just standing there recording it. And um, what ends up happening is I'm out there, and I'm, like, checking on this guy who's on the ground, and he's been pepper sprayed. And just to see him, he's all right, and he can move, and, he, and he's like, yeah. And then the, there's a series of eight or nine flashbang grenades that ended up going off, like, right in proximity to me. And then uh, a bunch of tear gas, a bunch more tear gas was fired in my direction. And police started charging and yelling um, as they're running at people. Uh, they do that. They run about maybe like 50 feet, and then they stop, and they line up, just kind of intimidate and scare everybody back. And uh, they were getting ready to charge me, too. I started backing up, and then they started firing tear gas. And so I, um, I backed up and uh, got out of there because I got hit with a big old cloud of it. So that's what happened uh, yesterday. Right. What was that experience like, getting hit by the cloud? Um, well, it, it, it takes a second, um, as I had a mask on, um, I was trying to keep my distance from everybody because we're still in a pandemic. Right. Um, but, um, it like, at first it got into like my tear ducts and it started burning. Um, and, uh, I was just trying to like ignore it for as long as possible, but it got really difficult once I started, uh, having to breathe. I was breathing it in. I just, it was unavoidable and, um, it just, it just was like very irritating. It, uh, you just can't stop coughing, and uh, it's like when you have like a violent coughing spell, and you can't stop. It's kind of what it was like. Um, so yeah, it, it sucked for about fifteen twenty minutes, and uh, I was able to finally like get out of there composed, you know, no problem. But yeah, it it was not fun. So, right. but I'm all right. Right. Well, I'm, of course, I'm happy to hear that, but I'm sorry to hear that uh, you had to go through that at all. I think that, you know, you see the tear gas and the clouds on, on television and you hear people running and you can hear people coughing. But if you haven't been there and experienced it, you don't quite know uh, what it's like because there's also sort of, um, I know with pepper spray anyway, and so I would imagine also with tear gas that there's there's like a, an emotional component that comes with it, too. There's like the surge, you know, that oh, happens. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you get it like you get adrenaline starts definitely going as well. And um, like you're just like you're just out there and you're just like, holy crap, you're in the middle of it. And um, like it, what, what it does is when you get it, it's like um, you get kind of uh, it kind of like, I don't know, it, you get, I don't know how to put it, but it kind of gets like a, like kind of flummy. Like you're you get a lot of mucus going on in your throat and you start kind of coughing it up. And it just is like it feels like your throat's burning, like your esophagus is burning. And um and then your eyes, you just, you, you, they, you, they just start um, swelling up and you just start um, like, it starts burning your eyes too. And you're just like, you, it just, it's like this, uh, like this very, very irritating uh, feeling and you, and you just want to get out of there so you can breathe and you can see again. That's basically, it's just, you, it just gets you out of there as quick as possible. You just got to leave the area because um, like a little whiff of it's fine. But like, if it's there for like more than probably like 20 seconds or so, it, it really hits you hard and you got to get out of there. So I, I got hit pretty hard. There was like a couple clouds that just went right on top of me and I, I got hit pretty bad. So. Right. Right. And you're, you know, you're, you're young and, and healthy and all that. And so that's something that you can, you know, that you can tolerate. But I know that there also have been, of course, instances when people have suffered, you know, much more grievous harm from the so-called less than lethal weaponry. Oh yeah. I can imagine if someone had asthma, like how that would trigger an asthma attack almost instantaneously. Like that could cause someone that could cause someone with any kind of you no know, respiratory illness or anything like that. Um, like serious problems, like, like really severe, like that is that, that was really strong stuff they were spraying and, uh, and shooting around. So, yeah, um, yeah. So, if you have, if you ever have or know anybody that has any kind of uh, respiratory condition, stay away from protests where you could possibly get tear gas because uh, it is not good unless you have a gas mask, a really good one. So, I was ill prepared. I just had a uh, N95 mask on. That's all I had. It does not work for tear gas. <laughs> right. Right. No, no, I, I don't think it does. So, you also mentioned that there were um, flash, uh, flashbang grenades. Yes. Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, they were, they were. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to ask you just, just to kind of describe that a little bit more, what that's like to be around that. 
Um, so it's just basically like a big giant firecracker, um, or an M80 as they're well known. Um, they, the police have them, they look like little grenades and they just pull a pin and, and throw it at people. Um, they were throwing them into people, um, which I believe you're not supposed to do. I believe you're just supposed to roll them on the ground in their general direction. But I saw them throwing them into crowds of people and, uh, exploding, um, like within inches of people. Um, they were rolling them down the street and they were exploding. Um, they would just take them and just throw them in the air and they would explode um, just any which way you possibly could could throw them. The police were throwing them. And um, those are used just to cause a shock and disorient people and scare them so that they just want to get out of there. Um, as someone who's been around plenty of those in my life in Portland, um, they really don't phase me anymore. Um, <laughs> it's just like... It just, it's just a loud boom, and then, you know, the followed by another loud boom, and then another loud boom, and then as, as many as they release. So, yeah, there was, there was at least a dozen or more of those um, right there on uh, the intersection where everybody was protesting. It was interesting because after they had uh, used the flashbangs, uh, everybody kind of, like, ran and then came back, and there was, like, a line of people that lined up right uh, where the crosswalk was uh, directly on the opposite side of the street. So the police are on one side on, they were on the east side of the street on that crosswalk. And then, you know, you have the street in the middle where traffic usually runs through. And then you had the other crosswalk on the west side of the street where people all lined up and came back and they're standing shoulder to shoulder and they're putting their hands up, come out and they're like, they're like, don't shoot, man. And uh, the police just, just charge them. But for a minute, it was like the lines were drawn in the sand right there. And it was kind of like they were staring each other down. So that was pretty interesting. Right. And and this is all still last night that we're talking about Tuesday. Yes. And this yeah, was this uh, still night. before curfew officially hit. Yeah. Yeah. They had, um, they had actually done all this. Um, well, it was about, it was about uh, 703, 705. And the curfew was at uh, 8 p.m. And uh, the police decided to uh, open up uh, traffic because that was their main concern, even though the streets had been blocked for hours. So it was it was pretty ridiculous. Right. Um, we'll now be op reopening Main Street to vehicular traffic. <laughs> that that's that's basically what they're saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and they were saying that it was considered an unlawful assembly. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> and. Um, they they use they used to have a big ice cream truck, um, which I know you're familiar with. I remember it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A big white van with two giant speakers on top, and now they use just a regular like Ford Explorer with an LRAD system on top of it, uh... um, which um, which is crystal clear, and you can hear that thing for blocks. It's piercing. Um, oh wow! And it's just this small small thing that's probably about. Um, about uh, two feet across and a foot and a half high. It looks a little dish on top of their, on top of their uh, SUV. So it's it's pretty crazy how small it is now. But uh, yeah, it's loud. It is really, really, really loud. Wow. Okay. And no more jokes about the ice cream truck. That's too bad. Yeah. No. Nope. It's retired, I guess. So what happened? So where where did you end up being? You know, at eight o'clock. Um, I ended up getting out of there. Um. Because, like, I was still kind of, like, trying to uh, – I just got out of downtown. I, I, I just crossed the river. Well, you um, got tear gas. You get to go if you want. Yeah, yeah, I left. Yeah. Um, and, and I was just trying to, like, um, to just kind of collect myself. I hadn't really um, I hadn't really been tear gas like that before. And so I was just kind of, like, looking up, like, what should I do and get tear gas and how right. to uh, decontaminate and stuff like that and – you know, that's what I was looking up when I got out of there. So, and then I, then I posted a message, you know, because I know some people were like waiting on me and they were like, I was getting a bunch of messages. So I posted on Facebook and I'm like, just got tear gassed and, and flashbang. I'm, I'm, I'm all right though. You know? So yeah, I, that's what I posted. Yeah. I saw yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I saw that. And I'm like, Oh, I got a call. Okay. I gotta, I gotta get more. I gotta find out this story. So yeah, yeah. So that's what happened uh, with that. And then um, I guess like afterwards, um, 
the police went around downtown and they were going in um, patrols of four police cars at a time. And um, they were kind of scattering around. And what they do is uh, they, they would just get out and if they saw people and they would surround them and, and give them uh, citations or arrest them depending on what they felt like doing. Mm. Uh, and they just kept on doing that until they eventually cleared all the people they wanted to selectively. Um, it wasn't just across the board generally. They were selecting people and just giving them tickets or arresting them. So uh, there were, I think there was at least nine minors that were arrested yesterday. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then um, I think the youngest adult that got arrested uh, was 19. They arrested, they've arrested like 48 people total in the past two days. I don't know how many of them arrested tonight, though. Right. Uh, and I assume there must be jail support set up for this. Yeah, there's there's jail support set up. I'm not um, involved with that, but the National Lawyers Guild's been out there and uh, they've been doing legal legal observing, uh, observation and stuff like that. So okay, cool. I'm sure I'm sure the ACLU's out there too. So right, but like people have a number to write in Sharpie on their on their arm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what's going on out there. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And so then you ended up taking the the bus home, or? Oh no, I was in a car. I I, I rented a car, so I was. Oh okay. Yeah. Okay. So, you, so, uh, so you weren't out after eight. You didn't see what if, if uh, yourself what was going on after that. No, but I had a bunch of live streams going. Right. Um, so I had eyes down there um, while I was at. Uh, I ended up getting home and uh, recovering. Right. So I was like, I was like observing it well into the evening. So yeah, it was it it after like. About nine or so, it started to die down pretty significantly. But there were still people out, uh, still like well after eleven. But it wasn't. It was very, very, very small on the on the first night. The police, um, they they were not prepared. I don't understand how they weren't prepared though. After what they had seen in uh, St. Paul and Minneapolis, like um, because there had been protests over there and um, just. Portland being Portland, they should have been aware, like in my opinion, that there was going something was going to happen. Um, but they were totally unprepared, it seemed, for the first night. And there was there was about three thousand people downtown. And when the police finally started coming out, they were keeping their distance for a long time. They were staging across the river underneath the Hawthorne Bridge on the east side oh, wow. of the river. Okay. And they were kind of keeping their distance and um, they were just like trying to stay out of sight. And I guess that was intentional so that they didn't escalate things, um, which in my opinion was smart. But um, they, they kept their distance for a really long time. And that that and uh, like people just went around and started doing whatever they felt like doing because of that. And then when um, they finally started to show up um, and scatter people, those groups broke the, that big group broke into like five to seven different groups and started setting uh buildings on fire breaking windows they all they uh they i like to point out that they targeted um all the places they targeted were corporate um large chains except for i think maybe a jewelry store but i think that jewelry store was probably a large chain too but they went after um places like chase bank capital one bank wells fargo Places which are well known to exploit people of uh, you know poor and 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 you know low middle class um, for like you know all kinds of overdraft fees and things like that. Um, so people went people went there and hit those businesses. They uh, hit a Starbucks, of course. Hmm. That they did. That was where the old Galleria was on Tenth. Um, right. And uh, there's a Target that's now above that, and so they hit that. Target seems to be a big target. For some reason during these protests i've noticed it's a minneapolis based chain oh really yeah yeah oh i didn't know that yeah there was there's a department store um chain there uh called dayton's you may have heard of the former senator from minnesota whose last name was dayton he was part of that family oh yes right and so dayton's bought target at one at one at one point (laughs) Mm, yeah well, the, 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 all these places were pretty far spread apart. I mean, we're talking probably about, I don't know, probably a, like a square mile, like where everything was, um, because downtown Portland is, it's not that big. The blocks are kind of small, but um, 
but yeah, it was uh, it was all over the place. And people, because there was so many different groups of people, like there was five to different seven, five, yeah, five to seven different groups of people running around. Um, the police couldn't keep up. And when they would go to one place after they were like locking down another place, like Pioneer uh, Pioneer Place Mall, which is in the middle of downtown, got broken into. And people like uh, ran in and uh, like took a bunch of Louis Vuitton bags and were running out with like armloads of like eight thousand dollar bags, which I thought was kind of funny. But um, <laughs> that like, is funny. <laughs> yeah, like they're all just running out, and uh, so the police show up to protect Louis Vuitton. <laughs> and uh, and uh, by the time they get there, everybody's gone, and they're down the street two blocks across the street from Pioneer Courthouse Square um, at the Chase Bank, smashing all the windows and lighting fires inside there. And then the police leave um, the Pioneer Place Mall and go to like you know secure the area for the fire department. And by the time they get there, everybody scatters and they're back at the mall again, going back into the store, taking whatever they left behind. So <laughs> that just kept on happening all over the place. And, uh, you know, the the mayor got really pissed off and uh, was all <laughs> making a big hoopla about it and then instituted another curfew for today, which was interesting because today the the police kind of took like a softer approach to their tactics in the beginning anyway, um, before they started tear gassing everybody again, they were getting down on one knee with protesters and stuff like that. And it looked like they were trying to psychologically appeal to them, you know, so that, you know, they weren't like as aggressive or whatever, uh, or they thought they were going to be, gross. I don't know, like, but they, yeah, what's, was, what's that about? I haven't really heard of, the cops in Portland doing something like that. What was going on? I, I don't know. It was really interesting. It was like they were trying to appeal to the protesters psych psychologically, you know, like um, to like make them like think that they're on their side or something. And I was like, I was like, okay, that's interesting because, you know, I've never seen that before. And um, it's just all I've seen from the Portland police have just been escalation tactics. And to see something like that, like a more human side, was very interesting. I've never seen anything like that. So. How many how many officers were involved in this? Uh, there was a line from uh, one side of the street to the other, so about 30. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And they yeah, all it. got down on one knee? They did. Wow. Did they just do that or did they also say no they didn't say anything either they just they didn't did that. say anything huh. yeah they, they just did that yeah interesting so, it was interesting like all at once yep hmm and then later they just tear gassed everybody <laughs> yep and then they tear gassed everybody <laughs> i mean <laughs> well i don't know what's well then what was that <laughs> yeah it's like oh time to get paid you know like i always tell my friends i'm like you know, if a police officer has to be choose between you and their paycheck, they're going to choose their paycheck. So they're going to follow their orders, you know, whatever they're told to do. So yeah, it's that's, just like, don't trust them, man. Yeah, um, that's the story. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. And like right now, like people are back at the Justice Center and police are there, uh, their gas masks on and they're, they're less lethal weapons pointed at them. So Right. And the, uh, the curfew tonight was 8 o'clock p.m. too? Yeah, it was an hour and a half ago. Um, there were there were a lot of people that were that ended up going all the way down to 60th and Gleason, uh, which I was uh, pretty surprised. Wow. That's, yeah, no, yeah, northeast 60th and Gleason. So I was like, whoa! And then they went all the way back down to Portland uh, downtown. They crossed the Burnside Bridge, so they walked far. They stopped at 47th and uh, Burnside. Um, where um, there was an old police station there that hasn't, it's not very active anymore. It's not used as a building anymore. It used to be a precinct building, but it got decommissioned. And then there oh, was a bunch Oh, yeah, right? And there was like that pizza place across the street from it, right? Yeah, the pizza place is still there. Uh, right, but, by uh, Laurelhurst. Yeah, yeah, they were, they were. oh, yeah, that's right. They were, they were in, they met in Laurelhurst Park. That was what happened. And then they went up to 60th and Gleason, and then they came back down Burnside, and they went back to the city center. Oh, so, that's interesting. So there was... Yeah, so there was that that happened, and there they were the larger group, and then there was a group that was downtown, and then they they they've now met up. So um, now it looks like everybody is uh, has congregated again after uh, being dispersed by the police earlier, uh, just a few, like half an hour ago. It's it's uh 
looks like it's going to get intense here probably in about another 30 minutes. Wow. So um, has there been, have, so far, has the, this all just sort of been very spontaneous or has there been organized aspects with like, you know, speakers or anything like that? Um, it's been mostly kind of like off the cuff on the fly. People just kind of meet and gather up and then um, people get up and speak. And you're having people from like, all different walks of life, all different parts of the community, um, all different ethnic backgrounds, religious backgrounds, um, just, you know, like all different uh, sexual orientations, just get up there and start speaking. And, um, you know, while they're up there, they're they'll, in between people that are talking, they'll get people to chant. Uh, people are bringing like water b bottles of water to them, you know, so people like, you know, have constant water, um, like everybody's kind of taking care of everybody out there. It's, it's really interesting. There's, um, it's just, it, everybody's just kind of doing their own thing and they're out there to, you know, support, um, the families and bring attention to like all the other victims of police brutality and violence. And, uh, of course, uh, you know, talk about what's going on with, um, George Floyd and, um, how this has been something that's been going on for as long as anybody can remember and how people have been patient and they've been uh, peaceful and they've been waiting for a long time for police and other government officials to change and make change happen for the better. So that, you know, instances like this where an innocent black man, you know, loses his life, you know, on the street crying, to his, his dead mother um, for like, and, and, you know, being because the officer is putting pressure on his neck. Um, it doesn't happen again. Nobody wants to see that. And so everybody is, you know, on the same page. Everybody's outraged that um, this has been going on for too long. And the reason why, like, people go, well, why are they smashing buildings? Why is this happening? It's because, you know, everybody, we've done what they've wanted, you know, through their process for so long, gone through their red tape for so long. You know, watch their officers get exonerated after they kill people for so long. And now people are like, all right, you've ignored us for too long. Now we're going to make it so you can't ignore us anymore. And we're going to fuck shit up because you pushed us to this point. So now you're going to have to deal with the problem you've created. And they have created it. So, you know, it's in their face now. And they really, they, they, they don't know what to do. And these protests have no sign of stopping. And, and you know, now you've got the National Guard involved in other places. There haven't been any National Guard out here in Portland yet, um, but um, it's 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 an interesting environment right now because um, uh, bordering counties are no longer backing up the Portland police because um, the the last police chief, uh, Daniel Outlaw, she um, she was not willing as long and the mayor was not willing. He's also the police commissioner to um, indemnify other officers legally. Um, if anything like happened, uh, like let's say like they were involved in um, an officer, um, like his, his struggle with another person and that person ended up hurting uh, or that officer ended up hurting that person and uh, causing damage to them. And there was an officer from another county involved. Um, Portland police were not willing to indemnify them to protect them legally. So Clackamas County, uh, Washington County, um, other counties around Portland um, are no longer backing the Portland police up for their protests anymore. Um, a few, a few did, uh, like I think Washougal did, and maybe like a few others, but they're very small in number. So it's kind of like it's very insignificant. The other police departments are saying, "Hey, we'll go and we'll like answer like you know uh, domestic." Uh, abuse calls and like you know we'll go take care of traffic incidents and things like that but we're not coming down to back up uh your protests anymore so they're kind of on their own now it's really interesting it's different than what it used to be it used to be like an overwhelming use of force and they don't have that anymore maybe it was maybe like it took them so long on the first night because maybe they were like calling up those other agencies and they were being denied and they were trying to figure out a plan i don't know how it was working but uh it seemed like there was definitely like a lot of lag going on there the first night that these were happening in Poland. So it's interesting. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, 
please consider supporting Calibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Calibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... Yeah, I'm really glad to hear that they weren't, um, that those, the outlying counties weren't coming in and helping downtown. Because when I would be at, at Actions downtown, that would be so incredibly annoying. Because, of course, one of the problems with policing is that officers are not required to live in the communities that they're policing. That leads to issues, you know? Yes. And so to be down there and be like, wait a minute, why is, you know, some sheriff from Washington County, you know what I mean? Like, no, he doesn't need to be riding my ass. Like, this is none of his business, you know? Yeah. He needs to go. He needs to get out of here. (laughs) Yeah, right? And I mean, you know, and and I saw a graph that was showing um, cities in the U.S. and the percentage of cops that they have who live in who 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 live in the cities where they work and Minneapolis has one of the lowest percentages in the oh, country. Oh, yeah, it's like 5%. It's like yeah. 5% or so? I, yeah. I can't remember if it's actually as low as 5, but it's really it's it's super low. It's super low, you know? And that's that's part of the issue absolutely because, you know, Minnesota, I see I lived in Minneapolis for a few years, you know, uh, a couple different times. And so I was I was recognizing a lot of these locations that they were bringing up. I know some of these neighborhoods and something like this. And, you know, when I lived there, you know, most of the um, most of the diversity in the Twin Cities is in Minneapolis or in St. Paul. And the suburbs are predominantly white, you know, and so that's who you're pulling in, you know, and I briefly lived in a suburb of. St. Paul, um, on, on the, over on the east side, uh, in the, and this was in the early 90s when I was uh, just out of college. And I was living out there, and I ended up going to some party that my uh, uh, that a friend of my boss was was throwing. And I was working at a convenience store, a gas station at that time. It was one of the best jobs I ever had. And my manager and I used to party. And anyway, she took me to this friend's party, <laughs> and and you know, it was awesome. And so and and. And the guy was a cop, right? And he was a cop in St. Paul, you know? And I just didn't really care for him as soon as I met him, not because of that, but just because he was kind of a cocky jerk, you know? But anyway, yeah. he like pulls his rifle out, right? And I'm assuming it's got to be not loaded, right? Okay, but he's like passing it around at the party. He like passes it to me. We're in the kitchen. He goes, here, hold it, you know? And I'm like, well, okay, I'll, I'll hold the rifle because I don't remember. Maybe I never even had it at that point in my life. So I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll hold the rifle, you know, just to see what it feels like. So I held it and he goes, okay, now here's how you hold it. He was like, show me how to hold it so I could aim and this and that. And he says, there, aim it over there at the, uh, at the coffee maker. I said, okay, yeah. He goes, okay, now imagine that's a N word. And he said that. He just said it. He didn't say N word. He said Whoa. it, you know, right? And so, you know, yep, just imagine that's an N word. You know, that's what he said while well, you're pointing your gun at it. I'm like, wow, okay. So, you know, that could not possibly have been an isolated individual uh, given yeah. the, the, the culture around there, you know, because, you know, Minnesota is, is like much of the North, you know, where it pretends that it's not as racist as the South, but it's just a different expression of racism. Yeah. Oregon is the same way too. Oregon. A lot of people don't know. It's a very racist state has a very racist history. Um, like one of the things that was written in the Oregon Constitution was the fact uh, that they did not allow slavery in Oregon, and how they did that was they didn't allow anyone, any any person of color into the state. Um, so that wasn't ratified in Oregon's con- until like taken out of Oregon's Constitution until like 2008 or so. Yeah. So um, it it Oregon is like 97 percent white, um, and uh, you have you have different like. Um, like you know, liberal and like, you know, left and then right, you know, literally like the West side of the state from the Cascades is more, more liberal. And then you go to the Eastern side of the Cascades and it's more right wing. It's just, you know, ri- basically people on that side, on the right side, on the, um, the Eastern side vote, you know, Republican and the people on the, the Western side of the Cascades vote, uh, you know, Democrat or independent or whatever it is, but uh, mostly because um, that's just 
the Willamette Valley where most of the population is. Um, but uh, generally, when you have more metro areas, they they're more left leaning anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, Oregon is a pretty racist place too, and you see it. Um, there's lots of there's lots of it here, um, which people are kind of shocked when they learn about that. But it's something that has to be identified and acknowledged. Um, otherwise, um, it's not going to ever change. So. Right. Well, you know, there's a city in Southern Oregon called White City. Oh, yeah. You know, and there used to be white crosses in all of those towns up and down that whole corridor along the west side there. You know, white crosses, uh, you know, at the edge of every at the edge of all these different towns, you know, and that's what that was about, too. That was also, a, you know, and Eugene still has theirs. Oh, man. Yeah, I know. And it's like, why, why do they, I mean, I don't know, for some reason they're able to get away with it there, even though that's arguably the most liberal, uh, you know, place in Oregon, actually. Yeah, that's crazy. I, I was, um, another interesting thing is I was, uh, my brother, he, um, he lives in Arkansas uh, for his job and reasons like that. And uh, he was telling me about places over there. And apparently Harristown, I think it is, it's, um it's like the the birthplace of the KKK or something in Arkansas, and they ha- and and we drove by it, and they've got this big billboard that has a white family on it, and says, "There's nothing wrong with loving your own kind," and it was like, "Oh shit," you know, like, and it was up really high off the ground, so you know they they know that people are going to try to vandalize it, but it's there, you know, it's just like blatant racism. It's just like crazy, so. Oh, and then here in Portland right now, some guy looks like uh, he's it doesn't look like he's uh, he's very fond of uh, the left. He uh, just tried to drive his truck through the crowd. Oh, yikes. And uh, and uh, he's flipping them off and they smashed his windshield and and, uh, flattened one of his tires. So he's uh, backing up right now onto fourth in Maine, heading west from the crowd, which is on third in uh, Maine. Um, looking at him, so yeah. How big's the crowd look? Oh, there, there's easily about a thousand people. So, yeah, yeah, he's backing up slowly, um, but uh, yeah, he he got what was coming to him. Apparently, uh, nobody's really following him. There's a few people that are kind of walking towards the car, uh, but uh, yeah, he's they're letting him go, so he's not right. in any danger. So there hasn't been anything yet in Portland like we've been hearing about. Uh, hearing rumors about and different reports about from Minneapolis of right wing people coming in, like explicitly, obviously right wing people coming in and stirring up trouble. Um, I haven't really seen any of that. Um, uh, and I don't know where that would have happened. It's mostly just been police going in and uh, for the most part, um, just like shooting all their less, less lethal weapons at people. Um, and, um, you know, it doesn't look like, it doesn't appear that any of those elements, there was a few, actually, I did see a few fights that were, that happened, uh, between people who were out there, uh, um, saying they supported Trump and stuff like that. And I was like, wrong place for that right now. (laughs) And, uh, they decided that, uh, they were going to do it anyway. And, uh, they started picking fights with people. And uh, there was a few uh, fistfights that broke out. But other than that, um, you know, nothing else seemed to happen in that regard. Right. And you said that the crowds of people who've been showing up have been pretty diverse. Yeah, yeah. They've been pretty diverse for for Portland, yeah. Um, And uh, it's surprisingly um, a lot of young people, uh, a lot of uh, young African-American people, notably a lot of young African-American women. I've noticed too. Right. Have you seen any, and, and if you haven't, that's just fine, but have you seen any mainstream news, corporate news coverage of any of this stuff? I mean, about, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah there was a, there was a reporter on, uh, on uh, new, uh, I was coin six channel six here um, who was actually um, complaining. She made, she filed a, com- uh, a police, complaint on the air uh about a protester you know just filing it from her phone she was doing like a like a a digital police complaint like she wasn't on like on the air but she was being like streamed you know live and so it was on the website and so 
even though she's not on television, she's still live. And she's, she's just talking about how she's filling out this police complaint about this protester on her phone. You know, and it was just like, are you serious right now? It was just completely obnoxious. Wow. So, was, uh, was her name Karen? Oh, possibly. <laughs> I don't know. But um, it was like she was it was it was I forget her name, but um, she was definitely on there. And then I had a few friends that I linked that to and they saw that as well. And they were just like, what is wrong with your reporters in your city? They're god awful. And I was like, yeah, it's the corporate media in Portland. They tend to do things like this. They always side with the police and whatnot. And uh, there was a lot of that, especially in the night where windows got smashed in downtown Portland. They were really playing that up uh, a lot. The last time I've ever seen windows smashed here in Portland was back in 2001 on any mass scale. And that was because in uh, 2000, we had a mayor, Mayor Vera Katz, who oh, you yeah. are familiar mm -hmm. with. And um, she spent uh, two years with a budget for a New Year's celebration, which happened to be 2000. So she wanted to spend a, a lot of money on that. And have a big fireworks show and bands and, and stuff in, in Pioneer Courthouse Square. So she did. And she said that would be the expense of next year's, um, next year's celebration. So next year comes around. It's New Year's. Everybody's downtown. There's like 1,500 people kind of hanging out, drinking, smoking weed, you know, doing their thing. And, uh, there's this kid that's down there and he's just kind of doing whatever. And, um, he's, 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 he's not, he's not 18. So, and the cops know this. So they're trying to go after him, I guess. And, uh, there's these four officers and they end up coming into the square and everybody's kind of like in a crescent around the stairs. And this kid comes from like one of the corners and he comes into the, the, the middle of the, the brick, uh, ground level area and these four officers tackle the kid and they're they're being really rough with them and people start getting really mad and one person goes down there and says if you fucking hurt that kid or you arrest that kid you're gonna have a fucking ride on your hands and the police just kind of laughed and they ended up just like putting their body weight on them and the kids yelling you know and they end up putting him in cuffs and all of a sudden people just started going ballistic and just smashing windows all around the square and police are kind of going, oh, shit. And they kind of got up and just had to, like, disappear really quick because there was no other police around there. And downtown got destroyed. Um, they basically, because of their heavy-handed tactics against a minor, caused a riot downtown, which got a lot of businesses, you know, smashed and broken into. And people just started looting them because of the police violence. And here we are, you know, 19 years later, and it happens again. So, you know, it just goes to show that it puts you some perspective in there. They really haven't changed much since then, I guess. Right. So. Right. And well, and then that story also just, you know, it, it, it just tells us something, you know, uh, about about, you know, protesting, you know, and, you know, especially when it gets to that level in general, where it's like, well, it doesn't come out of nowhere. There's warnings that come ahead of time. There's, oh, yeah. you know, here's what we want. Here's what we need you to stop doing, et cetera. I mean, all of those things go out ahead of time. Like windows are not broken as a first resort, you know, yeah. like, yeah. And I mean, I, you know, I, maybe you've seen the, the picture that's been floating around the last few days. And it's a picture from 1965 from the civil rights movement in in in, in uh, Selma, you know, in the, in the famous, you know, town of Selma from that time. And there's an older black woman and she's standing there and she has a sign and the picture's in black and white and it says, stop police killings, you know, stop mm -hmm. police killings. It's like, okay, look, that was 1965 politely asking. So how long does the politely asking supposed to go on? I mean, it's just people are unaware of how the injustice has just been building for so long that oh yeah of course it's got to go somewhere yeah i mean people people don't realize like what rosa parks when she was on a bus you know and and, and she finally got you know famous after she got arrested you know that that one time it's highly publicized she had been on buses for 11 years getting arrested uh, and sitting on the front of the bus because that, at the time, you know, you had to sit behind the line, you know, 
a whites only area, you know, colored only area back then, you know, because that's, that's how racist it was back then. And, um, yeah, she refused and she had been doing that for 11 years. It took 11 years until finally, you know, that started the change. You know, people, people don't understand that these things go on for a long time before, you know, uh, there's these reactions to that kind of stuff. You know, um, it just doesn't happen overnight. You know, it's something that, that fumes and it grows and it, and it snowballs and it turns into this thing that becomes just very, uh, fluid. And, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's just like, it's like taking, you know, um, baking powder and pouring, you know, vinegar into it, like one of those volcanoes you make mm, in like right. you know, kindergarten or something, you know, it just started, just just goes all over. I mean, they don't, they just don't happen on their own. You have to add elements to them and then, you know, it erupts. So it's not, it's not something that just happens all by itself. It has to have these ingredients added to them. Well, and you know, one after the other until it finally goes. And uh, yeah, these things, these things, um, when people, they get to this point, people are, get really pissed and now that they've been going on for six days now, you know, there's no sign of it actually going away. It's growing. Um, I think the other night it was 40 cities. I'm not sure how many tonight there are. But, um, you know, people are seeing that, um, you know, that there's a lot of support for this. I mean, everybody's got a story. Um, everybody knows somebody who's ha- who has been affected by the police in a negative way or, you know, has had some kind of rude interaction or knows a story about somebody who was shot and killed or, or something, you know, it's, it, it's been going on forever. Everybody ha- knows a story or has heard a story or knows someone that's been affected by the police in a negative way. And, you know, and you, and you try to get to like any kind of accountability for them, you know, uh, it's just near impossible. Uh, like in Portland, they have the independent police review board, which has no, no legal teeth at all. It's a complete joke. The people who are running that are actually in charge of that. They're, they're people that are connected to businesses and money and they're, you know, they're friends with the, the former DA. There's a new DA coming in, which looks promising. Actually, he's pretty young. Cool. We'll find out how that works. But, uh, you know, there's uh, they have, they have no power at all. So any kind of recommendation that they do, it doesn't mean anything. Um, and then you've got, um, just all this stuff that's there, it just it just it doesn't work to a citizen's advantage. Like if you try to file any complaint, it nothing happens. If a, if a police officer does something, then uh, and he gets fired, for example, um, there was a mayor uh, that was here, Sam Adams. He fired a police officer, and then the the police union went to the state and got um, uh, an arbiter um, appointed. Um, and uh, they reinstated the officer who was fired by the mayor, who's also the police commissioner. So the the cop got his job back, and I think it was like after he had shot and killed somebody. So it was like, are you serious? Like, how do you get any? How, how do you how do you like do something about that? How do you how do you change that? The cop got fired for killing somebody, and then he got his job back, and now he's back out doing what he was doing before he killed somebody, so he could kill someone again. Like what? Like you just handed a a, a guy a, who it was questionable how he how what he did. You know that's why he got fired. You just gave him back a gun to go out there and do it again potentially. It's like holy crap. So that's the thing. That's like that's why people are so pissed is because there's there's no accountability. That's why people are out there saying they they there's no justice, no peace because they're they're so angry and upset. Because things like this have been happening all over the place for a very long time. And, uh, you know, people are out there, like, expressing their frustrations, especially now, like, with lots of people losing their jobs, you know, like, um, you've got people that are dying, you know, because of coronavirus during this pandemic, you know, that, that are, like, you know, all upset, you know, because they're being affected through that. You know, there's just all these different elements right now. And you just see, like, on a, on a national level, you just see the federal government just failing. You just see them just completely failing at everything, like, all over the place. Um, the only thing that the federal government uh, doesn't seem to be failing at is, uh, you know, how many tweets they can they can pump out on Twitter. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, I'm sure that you, speaking of tweets, I'm sure that you uh, heard of Trump's tweet today where he is saying that he wants to 
declare Antifa to be a terrorist organization. Yeah, it reminds me of the Green Scare um, right. earlier, um, which if you want to add more context to that, um, I'm, <laughs> I know a lot about it, but um, like, I, like, I seen like seeing people that I knew, like their house, their homes getting raided and things like that. But um, um, you covered that more uh, uh, when you were here in Portland, right? You know, a little yeah, bit more there was the, there was the whole scene where, well, because under the Clinton administration, there was the animal enterprise act or animal, Inter Inter animal enterprise terrorism. Was that what it was called? But that was where, I think the, so. that, that was where the whole idea of eco-terrorism came from was, was from that, you know, like that's when it became an official thing. Clinton really created that, you know? And so that was for, it was specifically meant to target, you know, particular types of, of, of act and environmental activists and, and animal rights activists, you know, and then George W. Bush is the first person who really used it, I think on a, on a big scale, you know? So then, yeah, what, that, what happened was, you know, what they, what they call witch hunt, you know, and they, they go after as many people as they, they could find. And, and a lot of times they would throw a tremendous number of charges at them, knowing that they can't all stick, you know, but just to force the person to like basically say what they know, you know, who they know, who they met or whatever. And, you know, they would give them, you know, it's basically threatening them to throw them in jail for life, you know, or, or close to it, you know, if they didn't yeah. talk. And so, so you didn't, oh, you couldn't always, you know, what, what people would say under circumstances like that. Of course, you didn't even know if it was factual because, you know, if someone's, if you're 20 something and someone's like, we're going to throw you in jail for 40 years, unless you give us some names. I mean, you know, Maybe you give some names because you don't want to be in jail to jail until you're is sixty something. I mean, yeah. I, I don't I don't know what I would do in that position. I mean, I'm older than that now, you know, and so it's it's a little easier to say, okay, maybe I'll go in. But you know, especially for a young person, what well, you don't want to spend your whole life in in jail. So anyway, that's the 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 fear, of course, now is that this um this oh, okay Antifa whatever, which isn't even an, org an organization, you know, no. being called a, a terrorist organization, that this will now be used in, uh, uh, as another way of of targeting people, of trumping up charges against them. Because now that he's called this, well, okay, now state legislatures can start passing laws. Now this and that. Now you know social media can decide how they're going to employ their algorithms to start censoring more. Like I mean, it's just it's ridiculous, you know. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know. It's, it was like, I believe, back after 9-11 and the, the passage of the Patriot Act, like you really started to see like things like that come out, too, with um, like enemy combatant statuses and stuff like that. So, you know, um, basically, you would not be uh, allowed a trial. You would just be prosecuted or you would just be arrested and then they could take you to a detention facility and you could just disappear. They'd make you disappear. Um like that's what people are talking about, like with this, not a few people that I've talked to anyway, yeah. they're, they're worried about that. Like people literally just, they, they, I mean, like I, I, you know, that you could basically, they were saying, basically you could go into their home and take them, you know, and if they, they saw on their Facebook feed, any text messages, you no know, known associates, they got a, they received a text message you know, stating something that, you know, they were um, invited to like a group of Antifa or something like that. Oh, you're affiliated loosely with this group or oh, we're arresting you, you know, like they're, they're all worried about that kind of thing from happening. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just, I'm like, I was telling them it's probably not going to happen. You know, there's, there's millions of people out um, right now, like at that point in time, like on the internet, posting uh about like anti-fascists you know right that on twitter it was like two million trending or something like that so i'm like that's that's gonna be a lot of people they're gonna have to deal with you know that's i'm like it's not gonna happen but the, I, i'm sure you know there will be some example which uh the federal government has been known to do like where they'll go out and they'll try to pick a few select people and try to make an example out of them to scare everybody else it's a favorite tactic of theirs so right. so yeah i hope that doesn't happen but um it's just more asinine bullshit coming from Trump, you know, um, trying to make trying to change the subject because uh, like over one hundred and five thousand people have died on his watch from coronavirus. And, you know, th there's what, thirty nine percent unemployment now or something. It's something ridiculous. Um, but, yeah, like 
yeah, he's trying to control the narrative and he's failing and he's getting yesterday he got put on lockdown in, in the white house twice. So, you know, like he's definitely losing control of the situation pretty uh, rapidly. from uh, a lockdown from protesters. You mean, yeah, they, they surrounded, uh, they surrounded the white house mm-hmm. and, um, and, um, uh, there was, there was people that I knew that were personally out there and, um, they went out there and they were, they were shot multiple times with rubber bullets. Um, they were pepper sprayed and they were tear gassed, um, several times. Um, and they were out there in DC and then the national guard came and started charging everybody. Right. Um, so yeah, that happened yesterday <laughs> a couple of times, but, uh, yeah, like, yeah, like they're losing control. Um, I was and, really, I was really happy to hear the White House was surrounded. I have to tell you, you know, like me too. That's great news, you know. I mean, there's a famous story about Richard Nixon, you know, being in the White House during some protests, and what they did is they circled a bunch of D.C. I guess city buses, basically around the around the you know the perimeter, um, in, in order to help you know protect the area, basically. And I guess that there was you know a particular incident there where Nixon was honestly afraid, you know. Oh, he wow. was he was afraid and maybe and I think it's a famous thing you can look up this conversation maybe he was speaking to Kissinger but don't quote me on that part and you know whoever it was he was talking to and, and he was scared that they were going to that they were going to come in and you know that's that's you know there's 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 some utility to leaders fearing their people there is you know and you know you look at you know a situation i mean you know because when there's no respect, that respect needs to get reset and reset somehow, you know, mm-hmm. and to, to, to remember that, OK, uh, the idea here is that you people in office are serving us. You know, the idea yeah. is that if you're in that White House, that you're serving us. The idea is if you're wearing that badge is that you're serving us. OK, you're not serving us. You're oppressing us. We need to remind you that that's not OK. Yeah, and that's what a lot of that's what a lot of this has been about too. Like people out there, like reminding the police that you're supposed to work. You you work for us. You know, we pay for you. You need to you know protect us, and you're not. You're killing us, and this is not acceptable. So, yeah, this is like you know you know cause and effect. For every cause, there's an effect. Checks and balances. You know, like and stuff like that, and uh, yin and yang kind of thing. You know, like and. Uh, you know, it's coming back, you know, it's swinging the other way now. And, um, yeah, it's, it's swinging back hard all over the place right now. So, yeah, I think it's a fascinating situation and to me. It doesn't feel quite like other incidents like this before. It you know. doesn't. No, no, it, it, it feels like, you know, the, the last time I ever saw anything like this, I mean, I was just a kid and it was like, it was 92, like when, uh, the LA riots happened. Mm. Um, I was only nine when that, when those happened, but, um, I remember watching them on TV and seeing them happen for days and, um, like going back and watching video on it, you know, years later on like documentaries and things like that. Uh, this is, that's the closest thing that I can think of right now. That's even similar to like what's happening all over the country right now. And that was just only in LA. We're talking, this is happening all over the country right now. I was just watching Boston in Boston, man, it was crazy in Boston. Uh, police cars were getting set on fire and, and people were having scuffles with the police. And um, it was it was pretty intense uh, over there. And um, also uh, in L.A., it was getting pretty intense as well. Um, just a few places that I saw. Um, but uh, yeah, over. Oh, yeah. Over in uh Birmingham, uh, Alabama. They were they were pulling down Confederate statues from parks. Even they were just oh, tying nice. ropes around them and just pulling them down. You know, so like people are like saying like on an institutional level, fuck this bullshit. We're tired of it. Yeah, and uh, and um, you know, you better wake up because you guys aren't the ones who are really in charge. We are.
Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.